Well, hello plant lovers, it is Matthew in Melbourne. Thank you very much for finding me on this very beautiful, sunny, late summer's afternoon here in Melbourne. Now, if you're interested, I grow cold, cool, oh, intermediate orchids here in Melbourne without any greenhouses or grow lights or humidifiers. I grow orchids outside or inside or not at all. So if that sounds like your bag, do hit subscribe. I post every week and I am an amateur with many failings and the odd success. Mm. And this really is one. This is a beautiful, it's, um, it's a hybrid called a Colmenara, which is now called Oncostelli. Names change, but anyway, one of those beautiful Oncidium Alliance hybrids, which is just delicious, which is what we're here to talk about. So I have here Exhibit A, which is a hybrid Oncidium type orchid of mine that I bought many moons ago during our many lockdowns in Melbourne, whenever a lockdown was announced, you know, like the next day, you must be home. That afternoon, I'd always run to my favorite nursery, my last bit of physical shopping and just see. And often I would buy oncidium type plants that had a dead flower spike because they were always discounted. And because the flower was dead, I never knew what it was, but they were always literally half price. So usually before COVID, before the lockdowns, I'd just go and buy myself a dead spiked Oncidium at half price. The label would just say Oncidium, and I would just grow it and nurture it and see what happened when it bloomed and try and identify it. This was one of those, and it is actually now called a Bialara Eurostar, which always makes me laugh because I think of Euro trash. But anyway, it's not trashy. It's a beautiful plant. And you know what, plant lovers, it needs repotting. So this video is going to be about the hows and the whys and the wherefores of repotting oncidiums. Now, we have to define our terms first of all. As you can see, I'm outside because it's a glorious day and we're going to be repotting, so it'll be messy. I'm in Melbourne, Australia, and our winters can get cold, but they don't freeze. And our summers can get warm, as it's going to be over the next few days, and dry. Now in Australia, we don't have the same climatic zonal system as you do in the States, um, but people would describe Melbourne's climate as perhaps warm temperate or wet Mediterranean because we do get rain in summer. But that means that I can grow quite a few orchids outside. So it makes my environment really quite good in many respects, but tricky because you've got to find out what can grow for you, which I guess is the whole point of this channel. And one of the things that grows really well for me, both indoors and outdoors, is Oncidium Alliance plants. And it will be the same around the world because generally the hybrid Oncidiums grow really well indoors as a houseplant. I needed to repot this and I thought, what a good chance to actually just tap back into some basic Oncidium care. So again, defining our terms, the first thing is I grow my plants both indoors and outdoors. Some plants I grow outdoors all year, some plants I grow inside all year, and some plants I mix. They come out in summer and in in winter. It really depends on the type. So type, what does that mean? The Oncidium Alliance is a kind of collectual name for many, many, many plants, including species, and then the hybrids derived from them. And the type of plants that you're most likely to find in a florist or a nursery or a garden center are gonna be hybrid Oncidium types. And they have all manner of odd names. So this one is a Bialara type. Uh, this one here was called Colmenara and now it's called Oncostelli. Um, this one behind me is a Odontocidium. And you can find things called Wilsonara and you can find all manner of other names, but ultimately it means that the species origins were from the Oncidium Alliance. And again, because there are so many species involved, it's kind of hard to generalize about their care. However, I would say, if we're just gonna focus today on the type of hybrid Oncidium type of orchid that you find in a nursery or a garden center or a florist, I think we can generalize about potting and care. Now, of course, there are many avenues you can go down about species on cidiums and all manner of other things. And some are cool growers and some are warm growers and there's a myriad of differences. But let's stick to this basic type. And I think we can generalize. Now, if you're interested, you can find out the origin of your hybrid on cidium type orchid. All you have to do, firstly, is have the name. Now, this one was unnamed. It was just called Oncidium. So when it flowered, I then just looked at 
Oncidium flowers and I just looked at endless, endless, endless pictures until I found one that was similar with a name and then I searched through that name to see all the variants to see if my flower looked the same and it did. Now though, with Google image shirts, if you take a picture of the flower, you probably have more chance of narrowing the field down in terms of some names. Anyway, it does take a bit of legwork if your plant doesn't have a name. But if it does, you can then go to a site called orchidroots.com and I'll put that below. Type in the name of your hybrid and that will tell you through the family tree what the origin of the species, as it were, was. So what were the species ancestors of that plant? And that can tell you where it was from, what kind of conditions those species like, which might give you an indication of what your plant might like. That's only if you really want to go down the rabbit hole, because otherwise we're assuming this is pretty generic hybrid oncidium that you've got from a florist or a garden center or a nursery, and it's going to take pretty average care, which we'll go through in a bit. Now, once you've found out the orchid species of your hybrid, you can then go to orchidspecies.com and look at the particular care and conditions of those species, which will really help you understand what your plant might need. So anyway, that's what you can do if you really want to start delving in, which probably in a few years you will, as I did. But I started off just thinking they were all oncidiums and they were all the same, for better or for worse. Now I'll drop in a picture of the flower. Now this particular hybrid has 11 species ancestors. So that is a really complex hybrid. So is it really of any use finding out about those? You know what? Perhaps not. You can go down that rabbit hole if you want, but it's perhaps not really of any use. Sometimes if it's a primary hybrid, which means it's a cross between two species, that is useful because that will give you a clearer indication of care. But something with 11 different ancestors, which all have very different growing conditions, pretty tricky. So the thing about hybrid plants of any type, whether it's an orchid or a rose or wisteria, whatever, they've been hybridized to promote bigger, bigger in the plant. So better resistance to disease, better growth patterns, bigger or more often flowering, uh, better fragrance, different colors. So generally a hybrid plant's going to be a little tougher and a little easier to grow perhaps than its species ancestors. We've now established where we're at. But the thing is, with this type of orchid that you will find in florists or garden centers or nurseries, the average sort of hybrid oncidium, there are a huge variety of them and very, very different growing types of plant in terms of the habit and how they actually grow, which does kind of affect how you're going to repot it, which is what we're ultimately going to do with this today. So if we have a look at this one, it has very, very large pseudobulbs. Well, not very, very large, actually, because there are bigger ones, but quite large pseudobulbs. And for me, it produces one growth a year. And then that growth matures and flowers. You can see all the dead spikes of the previous flowers. And very reliably so too. And the other sort of charming thing is, if we can see in there, it's growing in that sort of, what's the word? There's a word for that mathematical principle of spirals. Anyway, it's spiraling. So each new growth is sort of spiraling around, which is it's quite satisfying and quite beautiful. But how the orchid grows can dictate how you pot it up. So this one is kind of spiraling around itself, which means when we take it out, we can put it back roughly in the middle of the pot. But generally, you want the part of the plant that is growing to be towards the middle of the pot and the piece of the plant that is no longer sending forth new growth to be at the back. So you're basically giving lots of room for the new growth. So that's kind of a principle. But there are plants that grow in different ways. And it really depends on its origin. So this one is a Wilsonara, and this one is a type called Soulfire. This was a seedling I decided I couldn't live without. But as you can see, quite a different growth pattern. It's very much a lolla, and it's growing in one direction. So I potted it in the middle, and it just chose to go that way. So eventually when I repot it, I will need to repot this part of the plant towards the back of the pot to allow all the new growth room to move. And as a seedling, oncidium type, now that is, they are spider's eggs there, which I'm not worried about because we all need spiders in our life. Um, now oncidium seedlings are actually not bad value because they do tend to flower within a few years. So you don't have to wait a decade generally for them to bloom. So if you're into seedlings, it's a good way to experiment with oncidiums. But anyway, so just a case in point, different mega hybrids are gonna have different growth patterns, which will affect how you pop them. Now, this one is an odontocidium called Wild Willy Wonka. And this one is sending up one sort of quite vigorous growth. Um, 
in a very specific direction again. So again, I planted it in the middle of the pot and it's shown a very distinct direction. So again, when I should repot this in a couple of years time, I will move the plant to one side so that kind of the back of the plant is on the edge and the front of the plant has got all that room to move. So kind of observation as well, just to see what type of plant you've got and what its growing habit is. This Colmenara, which is now on Costelli, but I love the name Colmenara because it was named after Mr. Coleman of Coleman Mustard fame. Very similar habit to that seedling I just showed you. So we've got our fabulous pseudobulb, which then produces its new growth and it's growing in a very particular line. So again, when this needs to be repotted, I would be planting this part of the plant to the back of the pot and allowing the area, the front part, as it were, where all the new growths are coming from, to be more centralized so that those um, new growths have got plenty of room to grow and get their roots down into the medium. This is a beauty. Now the other thing about many many of the Oncidium Alliance flowers is that they're fragrant. It really depends and some are much more fragrant than others like the Shari Baby types um, but this one this is a sort of a group called Wildcat and most of these Wildcat types are fragrant but a lot of Oncidiums are. Ah, and they have delicious fragrance. So, I mean, some don't, but some really do, and a few of mine do. And actually, I've got a playlist of fragrant orchids, which I'll link, and that does list the fragrant Oncidium types I have. So that can be one of the reasons why you might decide to grow a particular type, that you just want fragrant Oncidium Alliance plants. Now, this beast here, <laughs> oh, look at that. Oh my goodness, mad, mad. And there is its flower spike there. Now this one is called Odontocidium piquant starts and I've made a video about this too. But this one has a very different growth habit. Look at that. It is really vigorous and it is producing multiple growths from multiple points throughout the year. So you can see there's a new growth coming here, there's a new growth coming from there. So really on the same kind of stem almost we've got multiple growth points. So this type presents a different problem because its species ancestors had a very particular growth habit. So you're going to get multiple growths all the time, which is great because each new growth can produce a flower spike and old pseudobulbs can't. Once it's flowered, it will never flower again. So the name of the game is to get new growth. Now this particular one and our Eurostar friend, for me, only produce one growth a year, hence only get one flower spike. Depends on the hybrid though, some of them will really grow throughout the year, all the time, which means ultimately you can get flowering sort of two or three times a year, depending on the growth you've got. And once you've got a plant that starts to get this big, you can effectively have flowers all the time. So this spike has just opened, and this had a spike just here actually, which has now gone over. Actually, I might come in a bit closer and just show you this plant and do a little bit of a tidy up because it is kind of mad growing very much on one side. Oh, something will have to be done with this at some point, but not today. Now, the whole what you potted in question, I'm going to say something scandalous now. It's almost immaterial and it entirely depends where you are and what your climate is. You can grow them in plastic, you can grow them in terracotta and ceramic. I mean, you could grow them in a teapot with a hole in the bottom. I mean, you can literally grow them in anything. I don't think that the vessel you choose really determines how well the plant does. Each vessel will have different qualities. So terracotta, I love for aesthetic reasons. It evaporates water quickly, which can be good and bad. It's good in winter because it means the roots don't stay cold, damp and miserable. It can be bad in summer because of that very reason it dries out really quickly so you have to water more often. Obviously it's a bit heavier and a bit more expensive but I feel terracotta for me is a bit more sustainable and also a bit more aesthetically pleasing. And you can see with this one that I have an orchid pot that is sort of pre-cast with holes and I also have a video about drilling holes in your own pots to make orchid pots because most oncidiums are epiphytes so they grow in trees on branches. And that's generally in a sort of a, a buildup of matter, like moss and old leaves, so they kind of get their roots into that system, but quite a contained space, but lots of airflow. So it's often a great idea to have a pot with holes because it just aerates the root system. However, you don't have to, and I've had this in this pot for many years and it does very well. So don't, again, get hung up on that. If you want to, you can. If it's impossible, don't worry. I think what is more important about growing oncidiums is the light and the watering. That will determine for me how well the plant does or doesn't do. 
Also, the medium that it's potted in will have an effect. So I think those things are more important than the actual vessel that you choose. So there you go. And of course, I only grow in terracotta with potting medium. And there are many different ways of hydroponic growing and leaker growing, all sorts of different things people use around the world. So again, there are many, many ways to do it. This is just how I do it and how it works well for me. But wherever you are, figure out what works best for you, really. I think now, without any further ado, we should spin the camera around and repot this one and we can just go through the details. I guess maybe before we do, the first thing is, well, when do you need to pot it? Hmm. Well, this crazy plant behind us, which is going gangbusters, it's actually only filled half the pot, although it's massive. So that looks like it might need a repot, but it was only repotted last year. So I'm going to leave that for a bit. This one has been in this pot for, as I said, probably at least three years, if not more. So probably, well, the medium is old. It may have broken down. The plant itself, though, is not filling the pot. So you could say, well, logistically, it doesn't need any more space. But I think from my perspective, it needs a refresh of its medium. And I think the leaves are just looking slightly as though they could do with a bit of a, a bit of a lift in terms of the quality of the medium. So it'll just help nourish the roots. So when to do it, million dollar question. Now, generally, these generic hybrid oncidium types will be sending up growths throughout the year. Their species ancestors may just have one growth cycle, generally in spring, and then it matures, then it flowers, and then rinse and repeat. But the hybrids can kind of grow at any point in the year. So basically, when you see your new growth coming, and this one, I would say, is about seven centimeters or about three and a half inches tall, that's kind of a good size. So the new growth is reasonably large. That new growth is going to be producing new roots, and those are kind of the ones that we want to really nourish and nurture. Spring is often a good time, but as I said, if it's sending up new growth at any point, then kind of any time, I would just avoid extremes of temperature, heat or cool. But there you go. So it is now summer. This growth is sort of at a good height. Spring would have been great, but the plant was in flower then, didn't have any new growth. So I didn't want to do it then. I'm going to do it now, plant lovers. So without further ado, let's turn the camera around and get on with it. So actually, before we get started on repotting this baby, let's just have a little look at our wonderful Ondontocidium piquant stance and just tidy it up a bit. So I'm using these really beautiful Chinese scissors, which I found in Shanghai, actually, an amazing metal shop that has been around since the 17th century. There is the brand name. And one of my viewers did translate it and tell me what it was, but I have lost that message. Anyway, beautiful scissors. Now, they're often just better easier to use smaller things to get inside. So generally, before you're gonna repot something, a good idea just to clean it up. We're not repotting this one, but it does need a clean. So you see all these old sheaths here, a very good thing to remove because they can harbor all manner of beasts. There's one there. Often they'll just pull off, but sometimes you'll need to trim them off. Um, now here we have the flower spike from the flower on this growth. So we're just gonna snip that off as down low as we can get, there we are. And you can see all of this massive growth. So there is a new growth coming out here. You can see there's a little growth coming out there. There is this growth here. There is a new growth coming there. This is a vigorous plant and it does need a tidy up. So I am just going to take out all of these old sheaths and just try and make that a little bit cleaner and neater so that we can allow all this new growth to happen and not suffer the indignity of insect invasion. So you see, fine scissors do make it easier to get into such a big complex plant as this, I have to say. One of the things too about allowing a plant to get to this size is that because you get so many new growth points, you get so many um, opportunities for flowers. Now you see these old leaves with these sort of dead ends. I do just trim them off. Now these leaves are on the way out, not for any sort of sinister reason, they're just old. And what I do is trim the ends off. It does make the thing look a little neater. Now this particular orchid, I have decided to grow outside all year. It was inside for a bit, but just because of its growth pattern, I found it really difficult to water uh, and keep moist, particularly in summer, because it just needs to be drenched, really, because of the size of it and the way it grows. So this is now a plant for me that grows outside all year. And I have to say, it's managed our winter minimums and actually bloomed for me 
um, in late winter. So it certainly loves Melbourne. There we go, okay. I think I've cleaned that one up enough. All right, this one can go back to its home and we can now focus on the real star of the show, this one. Now, if we look at the plants, so you can see um, where the old flower spikes were. So you've got one here and then we've got one in there and we've got one down there. All right, let's unpot this and see what we've got going on. This should have no problem coming out of the pot. There we are. So the first thing that you can see, perhaps clearly, is a lot of dead roots. So as each pseudobulb dies, its roots sort of diminish with it. And as the plant produces new growths, it produces new roots, which we can just see here actually, just starting to come out. So those are the roots we want to promote. And a lot of this old stuff you can see is very straw-like and the sheaths have come off, they're very dead. So we can actually just trim those off so we can give the plant a bit of a cleanup. So just being careful that you are only removing roots that are dead and no longer viable. So trim those off. Now, I often do leave some old roots just to give the plant a bit of stability in the pot. It does make it easier to pot it, I think, if it has got some old roots to sort of help keep it in place but we are certainly going to remove the bulk of these dead roots. Now, another good point with your scissors is to sterilize them. You can use heat, but you can also just use rubbing alcohol, which is a great way to sterilize your equipment. So I guess just don't be alarmed if you unpot your orchid and you do find a lot of dead roots because it is quite common and that is the growth pattern of this type of orchid that each new growth produces new roots and the old ones will die off. So don't be alarmed and think that your <laughs> plant is on its death legs. Because what you do want though, is new roots, which you can just see here, to be coming out of the new growth. That's the most important thing that should be going on. So you can see that most of these old roots are attached to these old pseudobulbs, which aren't doing anything anymore. Well, not true actually. What they are doing is providing energy for the rest of the plant but they're doing that from the energy stored in the bulb, not from the energy that the roots are getting. Okay, now you can see I've trimmed off a lot, but I have still left some of the older roots just to give the plant some stability when we pot it. Now here are some old sheaths and things. Now you can, there's an old flower spike. They might just pull off or trim them off. We're just giving the plant as much of a clean up as we can. Actually, what you can see here is a really good indication of the growth of the plant. So here's our pseudobulb. Here's sort of the rhizome that's sending out the new growth and the roots that it creates. And then as the plant matures and moves on, I guess, these roots then start to die off. The new pseudobulb takes over and then again and again and again. So that's kind of the growth pattern. Okay, so we've cleaned this up. Let's repot it. The other thing you could do at this point is actually remove any of these older sort of spent looking back bulbs if you want. Sometimes they might just come off quite easily and they might be really quite shriveled. These are not actually, they're still quite green and they're still offering some energy to the plant. So I'm actually not going to remove these. If they were really brown and shriveled, I would, but I'm not. And also they're not sort of lending themselves to come off. They're still quite firmly attached, but you certainly could. You could actually split this plant down there, remove these old bulbs, and you could actually pot them on and see if you were able to generate some new plants from those. But I am not going to do that. I'm going to repot it as it is. Okay, so here are the three ingredients to my mix for oncidiums. We've got a medium-sized bark, we've got sphagnum moss, and we've got perlite. All of these things you'll be able to buy from hardware stores, but you can also buy them online. Now again, this is just because this is the way that I pot things. Um, depending where you are in the world, you could perhaps just use sphagnum or you might just use bark or you might use something else. This is what works for me. The thing is just figure out really what works for you. And the best way to do that would be to join an orchid club. Anyway, this is what I use. Now, good idea with the sphagnum is just to chop it so that the pieces are a little smaller and it's just a little easier to mix and to use. And then just mix all of our things together. 
there are many different types of oncidiums, as we just saw with those ones I showed earlier on, and they all could have different roots. Some could be quite fine and fibrous, some could be a lot more thicker and vigorous. Good rule of thumb is the finer the root, the finer and the smaller the bark you want to use, the bigger the root, the bigger the piece. But again, we're being quite general. So this is sort of small to medium bark and this would work really with most oncidiums. And to be honest, I also potted my oncidiums in the first few years of my orchid career, just with out of the bag orchid mix from a hardware store and they did just fine. Now, we're using the same pot because the plant hasn't outgrown it as we've seen, voila. And the plants are epiphytes and they do like to be re relatively constricted in the pot. I mean, if anything, I could actually go down a size, but I'm gonna use the same pot. So the first thing we do is just fill the pot. Now, as we've removed quite a bit of the root system, we are gonna to need to make quite a mound in there to get the plant kind of up to the right level again because what we don't want to do is to bury the pseudobulbs too low or too high. We kind of need the soil level to be at the same point. And this new root that's emerging just needs to be covered with a little bit of sphagnum or potting material. So let's just see where that goes. That is perfect. All right, now before I go and pot the plant, there are two things I add. One is a few grains of a slow release generic fertilizer. So a little sprinkle, there we go. Now this is released over six months and it's a general food really for anything flowering. Now you can get food that is orchid specific. Again, I don't think it really matters. You can go down the rabbit hole of food if you wish, but for me, this type of generic flowering plant, slow release fertilizer really works. Now the next thing I add is this odd sort of substance. There we go. It is mycorrhizae fungi spore essentially. Just put a dash in. Now, mycorrhizae fungi occur in all the soils of the world, and there's probably millions of species of them, I imagine, and they develop a symbiotic relationship with the roots of plants and the soils. So the mycorrhizal fungi gets its energy from the plant's photosynthesis, and the plant gets nutrients and water from the soil via the actions of the mycorrhizal fungi. So it's a really important relationship. Now, most soils are gonna have it. It can't hurt the plant to add more, and it can only help it. Now, I'll put the link to the one I use, but you can really, wherever you're on the world, just find one that's recommended. Google around, have a look. You'll find it wherever you are. So we're gonna pop our oncidium in the pot. Now then, once again, I'm gonna try and get this part of the plant towards the side of the pot and this new growth towards the middle. We don't have a huge amount of room because it's not a big pot, nor should it be, but there we go. So then we just fill gently. Don't push down too hard. You don't wanna firm it too much because these plants do like a lot of air around their roots. So if you compact this too much, it could be a negative. There we go. Just push that in there. Ideally, the plant should be able to stand on its own, which is why I tend to leave a little bit of the old root system, just to help stabilize the plant. Now, it's often a good idea just to have a little bit of sphagnum around the base of the new growth where those new roots are, because that will retain moisture and just help that root settle in and find its course to further moisture and nutrients. There we go, okay. So, pop back in the label, and the next thing we need to do is water it. Now, with all my orchids, I use this. It's called sea salt, and it's a seaweed-based solution. So it's not a fertilizer, it's a tonic, and it really helps with the plant settling in. So if you order plants online and they arrive, it's a good idea to give them um, a watering with a diluted bit of sea salt or something similar in it. It really just helps the plant settle in, it helps the plant deal with stresses and it helps the roots really start to grow and flourish. So I dilute this to about one eighth, one tenth of the recommended dose on the bottle. Okay, give it a really, really good soaking in with that sea salt solution. There we are, plant lovers, newly repotted. You perhaps can't even tell the difference, but anyway, it is. And as you can see, I've tried to move the back of the plant to the side of the pot and put that new growth in the middle so that it's got more room to grow and then send out new growths over the next few years. So, Bilara Eurostar, hopefully you're on a wonderful journey to new health and vigor with that new growth. The other thing I didn't mention with this plant is it has a curious habit that 
it actually sends a flower spike from the apex of the pseudobulb and from the juncture of the leaf. So often you will get two, sometimes three spikes from one pseudobulb. So although it only produces one growth for me a year, that growth can have three spikes. So it's often quite a spectacular flower and they're really beautiful. I will drop them in so you get a chance to see. Anyway, plant lovers, I hope you've enjoyed our Oncidium repotting extravaganza. It's always tricky to figure out the hows and the whys and the wherefores. So as I said, this is just what I do. It isn't the only way or the best way. It's just what I do and what I figured out works for me. So just have a play and an experiment. And if you're into seedlings, then that's perhaps not a bad way to experiment with the type of potting material you want to use with the light and the watering, etc., etc. So good luck with your Oncidiums. And if you want to know what we're doing next week, you'll have to hit subscribe. So do that. And I very much look forward to seeing you every Friday when I post. So until then, take care wherever you are and I'll see you soon.